one of the things I love about Chris Burton is he just knows how to get things done. Were you watching him there as he was fixing that hole in his sock? You know, he even tried some electrical, or he thought about using some electrical tape. That's another great hack. It reminds me of something that happened, oh, about a year ago. Uh, I was right back here, and I caught my suit pants on something sharp, and it just did this gaping hole in the side of my pants that went quite a ways down, and it was right before the service, so I didn't know how I was going to uh, take care of that. And I think David was there, and I says, David, we got to find something. And, and so we finally found some black electrical tape. And so I got two big swatches of it and put them alongside my, my leg. And how well do you think that worked? Well, it worked for about five minutes. What I should have done, had I been like Chris Burton, I should have just magic markered my leg, and that would have taken care of it. You know, some hacks work really well, and, and some hacks don't work well at all. You know, I, I sit there and think about, that was a hack that didn't work so well. Chris has worked so well. And in fact, people now uh, fix their wood floors by using magic marker. A good hack. It works. The question from our scripture lesson for today is, does your faith work? Before I jump into the main part of the sermon, I, I just want to take a moment to say special thanks to all of you. Tina's been through a very difficult surgery this week, spent the whole week in the hospital, and, and, and the truth is she uh, got out on Friday. We got home about 6.30, and we took her back to the hospital yesterday at uh, 3 o'clock. And so she's there now, and we're trying to figure out what the next steps are with all of that. And, but through all of this, we have felt your prayers. She has a boatload of cards that she's received. We, we've had meals that have come in. We are overwhelmed by your love and support. So I just want to say thanks from the bottom of our hearts for the difference you make in our lives. And we know you do that for us, and you do that for the back, back Coalition, and you do that in so many other ways. You are indeed the body of Christ, and thank you for the difference that you make to so many people. So, the main question of James, does your faith work? The question for the morning. And the passage of Scripture from which our Scripture lesson uh, was taken is one that has been one of the most controversial in all of the Scriptures. In fact, Martin Luther hated this passage so much, he said that the book of James, the letter of James, was an epistle of straw and should be removed from the Bible entirely. Listen to how it begins. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if a person claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him or her? Paul has a very strong answer to that. Yes, such a faith can save. Because in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which was a core place from which Paul operated, he said, it is by grace through faith that we are saved, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And that is a powerful thing for somebody like Paul to say. I mean, he was a Pharisee. Everything was about what you did and how you behaved. I mean, 600 laws in the Old Testament just weren't enough. You had to add some more standards for behavior. What you did mattered. But yet what Paul experienced on the Damascus Road and his encounter with the living Christ made all the difference, and he found what he had been missing all his life. We want to pay attention to Paul because it reminds us also of some of our own history as the United Methodist Church, and that is John and Charles Wesley. Here was another group where knowing the right things and doing the right things was what really mattered. I mean, they were made fun of and called Methodists because they would gather in class meetings and they would do the same thing because doing the right thing mattered. They were Oxford scholars, so knowing the right thing mattered. They went and became uh, missionaries in Georgia 
because they wanted to be high impact followers of Christ. Doing the right thing mattered, but all of it kind of became empty and it wasn't until they met the Moravians on the way back to England when they were doubting their faith and everything that was about them that they experienced their heartwarming experience in Aldersgate a little later on May 24th, 1738. And that set fire to everything that they thought about and everything that they did. The encounter with the living Christ made all the difference. Their faith set what they did alive. So not long ago, just a few years ago, uh, uh, one of the professors at Princeton Theological Seminary, Kenda Chrissy Dean, wrote a book called almost Christian, which that title was a quote from John Wesley. That book asserted that our youth ministry was not doing what it needed to do with our students. That instead of raising fully equipped disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, we were raising what she called MTDs, and, and that was moralistic therapeutic deists. Let me break that one down a little bit. Moralistic meaning doing good things. Therapeutic meaning doing what makes us feel good together, a sense of community. And then deists, God at a distance. And often people who are more aligned with this idea uh, will quote uh, St. Francis of Assisi in, in these words, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. In other words, actions speak louder than words. And, and you can find that in Third Chronicles chapter 1. No, that doesn't exist. Now, Kenda Chrissy Dean then asserted that what was happening is we were raising students, raising our youth to where they would uh, grow up without the tools they needed to get through the ups and downs of their lives so their faith wouldn't really stick. They were doing good things, they were experiencing community, but they weren't having the full strength of their faith. Almost Christian then became a bestseller throughout the country. And there was a reason. It wasn't just about students. It was about people of all ages who is substituted doing good things and their sense of community for a living, vibrant. So that brings me to a question for you on this Labor Day weekend. What do you think about your work or your works of, of service? Is it just something that you want to do so that you will be a productive person, valuable in your society? Is it something that you do so that you have a sense of self-fulfillment in what you do? I think those things kind of drive each of us. But if that's all that drives us, that kind of makes us moralistic and therapeutic. The truth is, you and I have been called to do what we do in our service out of a central fire that's instilled in us by God's Spirit. We don't do good things to earn God's favor. Instead, we are filled by God's Spirit and a holy fire is set loose in us, and the more that we feed that fire, the more that we intentionally develop that faith, then there comes this outflow of deeds that we do. It's where our heart sings through what we do. But sometimes, I think we see our work life more as an expression of who we are. Uh, our, our selfhood. One of the things that's happening in our society as a whole is our biggest generation, the baby boomer generation, is all learning to retire together. Let, let me do some math with this with you. Uh, our oldest baby boomers are 74 right now. And our youngest baby boomers are 56. So what you have is a whole generation that's going into retirement together. Well, if you are experienced, if your life is that you are valued by what you do and how you do it, then there's a crisis that happens. Are you still going to be valuable after retirement? 
When the truth is, what we're doing is we're running a relay race with the next generation that are behind us, and, and we're running this together, but sometime we're going to pass that on. And when we pass that on, will we still be of value? And there's a crisis there that happens just about everybody who hits that particular age. But what Christ invites us to and what our faith life invites us to is not seeing our personhood in what we do, but seeing our living, growing faith in Jesus Christ, that ongoing firing up of our souls, that that becomes shared. And guess what? You don't get to retire from that. That's going to follow you all the way till you finish this life. That is actually something to look forward to. So, how are you being transformed in your life, in your walk with God, so that your heart sings what you do? Now, you would think that might solve James's argument, but it doesn't. James is not easily deterred. And so, he follows with this line of argument. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. What happens when faith doesn't work? And, and that's a really important question to ask in our own day. Because sometimes a lead accusation against the church is that we're cloistered inside our church and we're not really making a difference. We pray things like, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but we're not working toward that. So the group Casting Crowns asks it this way, if we are the body, and often the church is uh, described as the body of Christ in the Bible, so, but if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching, the song asks. Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? And why is his love not showing them there is a way? There is a way. Jesus is the way. We must never forget that as followers of Jesus, we pray in his name, we live in his name, we serve in his name, we serve as his proxy, we serve as his representatives in the world. That's job one. I've got to tell you, I'm a product of the Jesus movement. And so, I mean, we gave birth to the living Bible and reach out and all of those kinds of things, uh, you know, and, and so we came to faith in that. But there was a, a, a bias inside that movement, and that was if we all just came to a living faith in Jesus Christ that is, was, usually was particularly emotional, uh, then, then that transformation would make us world changers, and we would indeed fill the Lord's Prayer of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There were some people who did become transformational in their world, but there also were some people who ended up looking for the next spiritual fix, the next emotional high. And so we look at our world and sometimes we see that it is less whole, less peaceable, and less looking like the kingdom of God, less wise. I've come to believe that this choosing, whether we're going to be mainly believers in the faith or doers in the faith or talkers in the faith versus doers in the faith, is a false dichotomy that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we don't get to choose between these two. That's why I love our, our mission statement as a denomination where it says, we are to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This week I was on a Zoom meeting with large church pastors in our conference and with our bishop. And our bishop said that our mission statement was redundant to make disciples of Jesus Christ and then work for the transformation of the world. He says, I can't picture one without the other. And that's right. That if we're going to have a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ, then we're going to have transformational activity in the world that works through us. We have been transformed so that we will become transformers in our world, not pew-sitters, not people looking for what we've seen before, but actually becoming transformers new every day, 
the way I was a transformer when I was 30 and the way I'm a transformer when I'm 70, they're going to be different, but we're still seeking a transformational life in Jesus Christ that yields transformational action in the world around us, and the world's desperate for transformative people. So, you and I don't get the privilege of choosing one or the other. Oh, and by the way, those words of St. Francis of Assisi that I quoted earlier, that was actually a misquote. What St. Francis said was, it is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. It wasn't either or, it was both and. So, Tina and I were uh, at the medical tower on Friday learning the uh, antibiotic protocol that she was going to have to be in for the next six weeks. So we finished being trained on all that, and as we're going out, we had to go through the exit. And there was a lady in front of us uh, who was having just great problems, and she was asking us for help. And so I showed her, put your ticket in this way and follow that by putting in your credit card. And I looked at her credit card and it still had the label on it. She hadn't activated her credit card. Sometimes that's what's needed for us. It's time for the people of God to take our sincere faith and that faith of sincere fire and have it activated. And we put that faith into motion, into holy works and deeds, and then we continue to allow God's Spirit to fill, it, fill us, and we become more activated people of faith. And just to put an exclamation point on the whole thing, James writes in verse 19, so you believe in one God, good for you. The, belief, the demons believe that and shudder. A faith limited to my personal walk with God or limited to the walls and the seats of the church? Shudder the thought. God has made us for more. And all the people said, Amen.